Okay, it is now my pleasure to bring to you Mr. Breck Nave and his paper, Antigone versus Creon, Woo! the rematch. Woo! One particularly important question, which is, is it, which has existed for as long as society itself, is the question of where the line should be drawn between church and state. Along with that question must be asked which authority will be prioritized and at what point one should disobey one authority for the sake of honoring another. These questions are a few of the ones faced by Antigone in the play of the same name, where she must decide if she wants to obey the laws of her government, which she sees as unjust and impious, or if she will follow what she believes to be right despite the law. The two aspects of the contention, which would be the moral debate as well as the legal debate, will be examined. And within each aspect, one must examine the actions both of Antigone and of Creon, and how their actions conform to the moral and legal precepts which they individually hold, as well as the universal moral and philosophical legal standards. To understand the reasoning behind the decisions made by these two characters, one must have an understanding of the history. The contention between Antigone and her uncle Creon arose when Creon denied Antigone the ability to bury the body of her deceased brother, Polynices. Creon denied her this right because he viewed Polynices as a traitor. However, that is not entirely accurate. Upon the exile of the king of Thebes, Oedipus, his two sons, Ateocles and Polynices, agreed to take turns ruling for a year. Unfortunately, after Ateocles' year had concluded, he refused to turn the throne over to Polynices. Polynices brought several armies against Thebes, all of which were defeated, and Polynices himself died in a duel with his own brother, but not before fatally wounding Ateocles. The death of the two princes left the throne of Thebes to their uncle, Creon. Creon gave Ateocles the most honorable of burials for defending his throne, yet refused Polynices' burial simply because the prince had tried to claim what was rightfully his. An important fact to remember is that a burial in those days was much more than just a means to honor the deceased, because it was also a necessary step to release the soul from this earth if it is to be sent to the Greek afterlife. First, we will look at the legal side of the conflict. The easy answer here would be to say that Creon is right. They lived in an absolute monarchy. What Creon says is the law, and disobedience, which both Polynices and Antigone showed towards the laws, should demand punishment. However, the question becomes much more complex when we take a step back and look at the broader philosophical principles of government, which define what rights and authorities Creon actually has as the king, not just the power which he claims. In the initial conflict, Antigone sided with her brother, Polynices, who was, at the time, the rightful king of Thebes, by the agreement made between him and Ateocles. After the battle and deaths of the brothers, she continued to side with the one whom she believed to be right in the conflict. However, once Polynices was dead, Creon became the rightful king. His word was law, and therefore, whether Polynices had been right before becomes irrelevant. Antigone's political loyalty ought to be with her uncle Creon, or else it would be against her city. Antigone's actions cannot be excused from a legal point of view, for the reason that as far as she would, should be concerned, Creon is the law. The city of Thebes did have a patron god, Dionysus, and while he may have sided with her, they did not believe in divine right of kings, and so Creon's power was his own, and he does not answer to any god nor man. While one cannot rightly justify Antigone's actions, that does not make the laws and actions of Creon just by default. The philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau presents two primary arguments in his essay on the social contract. These arguments are that the government exists and has power solely by consent of the people, and the second is that the only purpose of the government is to ensure the freedom of every citizen to the greatest extent possible. Creon made multiple decisions which, which neither respected the citizens which are ultimately the source of his power, nor granted the essential freedoms to his citizens. First, he chose to side with Ateocles in the initial conflict, which demonstrate his, demonstrates his lack of respect for the existing rules and agreements, since the throne was rightfully Polynices by their agreement. The acceptability of his actions only went downhill from there. He denied Polynices a burial, which, by their beliefs, meant that the soul of Polynices will be trapped in this world forever, the worst punishment he could give to one already dead. Preventing the burial of Polynices was not only an offense to the prince, but also by refusing to allow him basic respect, Creon offended and disrespected his entire family, who were some of the most prominent citizens of Thebes. After confronting Creon, Antigone went ahead and buried her brother in direct opposition of the decree of her king and uncle. 
While this is a legally inexcusable action, the king's response was no better. Creon buried her alive in a tomb cave, where he intended to leave her to slowly starve to death, instead of having her blood directly on his own hands. While as the king, Creon does have the authority to execute miscreants when necessary, Locke says that the right of the, a government to punish criminals does exist. It is only to the extent that they punish, to the extent necessary to create repentance and to deter the criminal, and perhaps others, from repeating in a similar offense. Creon's actions not only went far above and beyond what Locke or any other political philosophers of the time would have allowed, he disrespected and went against the basic rights of his own niece. But more importantly from the legal view, he cruelly and unjustly punished one of his citizens. He demonstrated extreme lack of respect for his citizens, in cases of the entire family, as well as specifically to Polynices and Antigone. Both parties were clearly in the wrong from the legal perspective, perhaps Antigone more blatantly so than Creon, but both of their actions were legally inexcusable. Looking at it from a moral perspective, however, will reveal a whole new host of wrongs which were committed. The king, who is for all intents and purposes also the law, declared the action of burying the body of Polynices to be wrong. Antigone believed that she had a responsibility not only to her family, but also to the gods, and that it was her responsibility to bury the body of her brother. She had believed it was her duty to the gods to honor her brother and send him on to the afterlife. Creon made many reprehensible decisions throughout the story, no matter how one is to look at it, first siding with the unrightful king, then failing in his duties as the new king to show not honor but and not basic decency to his subjects and families, and even attempting to cause the death of his own niece. Not only were these actions contrary to the very purpose of kingship, they violated what moral standards there may have been, either the moral standards created by the general spirit of the people or the moral standards held by Creon himself. To understand the relationship between Creon and his subject, subjects, and the moral standards that are held in it, one must understand Hegel's levels of ethical life and the lordship bondage relationship. In the Phenomenology of Spirit, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel argues that the conscience of every man is interwoven with the conscience of others, and one cannot have any understanding or concept of oneself without a moment of identification with others. Contrary to the beliefs of Blaise Blaise Pascal that one's acknowledgement of existence comes from conscience of their own thought, Hegel believes that one's conscience and sense of self comes entirely from interaction with others. Man does not form a self-image from what he may think of himself, or from his ability to think, but from what he perceives others to think of him. Hegel presents several levels of what he calls absolute ethical life, the third and final level being in an advanced society where the individual is the indifference of all specific characteristics, and as such in a form, a whole living being, and is recognized as such. At this level, a living individual confronts a living individual, but their power of life is unequal. Thus, one is might or power over the other, one is indifference, while the other is fixed indifference. So the former is related to the latter as cause. Indifferent itself, it is the latter's life and soul or spirit. The greater, strength or weakness, is nothing but the fact that one of them is caught up in difference, fixed and determined in some way in which the other is not, but is free. This relationship in which the indifferent and free has power over the different is the relationship of lordship and bondage. Hegel here defines the ethical relationship between a being of greater strength or power and one of lesser as being a relationship where the being of greater power has freedom of action. Yet he points out that the seemingly weaker being, or the bondsman, has a greater freedom of will due to the fact that he is not bound to his own physical power, abilities, and possessions. The inner freedom of the lesser becomes manifest in the outer freedom of the greater, and both feed their own self-image from the views of the other. There's, this relationship represents not only the Lord's power over the weaker, but also a moral responsibility in the relationship. While Hegel says that at this point in the Lord and bondage relationship, there is no question of any right or any necessary equality, there is yet a moral responsibility held by the greater because his view of the weaker and actions toward him are what defines the being of the weaker. This relationship is important because it shows the nature and source of Creon's power and authority over his subjects, specifically over Antigone. 
and thus dictates his moral relationship towards them. And while it is a relationship of superiority, it is more importantly a relationship of responsibility rather than one of authority. Without it, Creon's actions may have looked bad, but with the light of this moral relationship, his actions are only uglier. Creon does not recognize his responsibility, believing that being king is about pleasing oneself. He asks, is Thebes about to tell me how to rule? Am I to rule this land for others or myself? The city is the king's. That's the law. He clearly demonstrates a lack of care for his subjects, both in his words and actions. As his own son Haman kindly pointed out, what a splendid king you'd make of a desert island, you and you alone. Though not overly respectful to his father, Haman was insightful and recognized the inherent folly that was present in Creon's paradigm. From this risky and tyrannical understanding of his power and responsibility, Creon came to many poor decisions. He denied burial to his nephew Polynices, which gained him nothing but some personal satisfaction and the great displeasure of Antigone. When challenged by Antigone, rather than recognize her and show the respect required of his position of responsibility, he chose to arrest and execute his own niece. When asked, what more do you want than my arrest and execution? Creon responds, nothing. Then I have it all, showing his despotic power, ruling by whatever whim he chooses to follow that day. As Antigone said, lucky tyrant, the perquisities of power, ruthless power to do and say whatever pleases them. Further showing his absolute disregard for the welfare of his citizens, which ought to be the highest goal of a man in that position of responsibility and power. Creon then sent his own niece to her death. Wall her up in a tomb. You have your orders. Abandon her there alone and let her choose for herself. Death or a buried life with a good roof for shelter. As for myself, my hands are clean. He ordered her locked in a cave to die of starvation or else die at her own hands, thinking this made him guiltless in her death, when in fact he bears responsibility, not only for the fact that she may die in the tomb, but for the cruel and unnecessary means of punishment. If the king is to sentence one to death, he ought to be adequately confident in their deserving of death, that he is willing to perform the execution himself. Creon displayed not only despotism, but also cowardice in the way he dealt with Antigone in this situation. None of these situations did he handle himself in the moral and responsible way that should be expected of a leader, but rather with selfishness and pride. Antigone believed that she held the moral high ground in this conflict. She recognized the power of the king, yet chose to ignore it for what she believed to be the right thing to do. When recognizing Creon's intent to inhumanely dispose of her, she confronted him, saying, Your moralizing repels me. Every word you say, pray God it always will. Give me glory. What greater glory could I win than to give my own brother a decent burial? She was disgusted by her uncle's attempt at piety, and trying to keep his hands clean of her death. She truly believed herself to be in the right, and thus had no problem with dying a martyr, even at the hands of her own uncle. She claims that her actions in burying her brother were admired by all, both citizens and gods alike. Who, Creon, who on earth can say the gods do not find this pure and uncorrupt? And talking of the citizens said, they would praise me if their lips weren't locked in fear. Creon did not try to defend any of his actions. He simply played the I'm the king card and said he could do whatever he wants. Antigone genuinely believed herself to be in the right. However, that does not mean she was necessarily right. Antigone was stuck in a position where she had to choose between honoring the gods and her brother or honoring a despotic, murderous tyrant who happens to be her uncle. Despite Antigone's altruistic behavior, there are many attacks that could be brought against her actions from the moral perspective. Creon asked if, indeed, she still had the gall to break his law, and her response was bold and disrespectful. Of course I did. It wasn't Zeus, not in the least, who made this proclamation. Not to me. Nor did I think that your edict had such force that you, a mere mortal, could override the gods, the great unwritten, unshakable traditions. This was taken as insolence by Creon, who attacked her character and actions, saying, The girl was an old-handed insolence when she overrode the edicts we made public. But once she had done it, the insolence twice over, to glory in it, laughing, mocking us to our face with what she had done. Even if there was indeed nothing wrong with her initial actions, as she claims, the way Antigone handles herself afterwards, mocking her king for questioning her actions, since he was a mere mortal, 
placing his words and laws against the gods and Antigone. Antigone's sister Ismene, while agreeing with the desire to have their dear brother buried, did not want to go along with Antigone against the crown. But when she realized she was implicated along with her sister, Creon saw her hysterical, gone to pieces, because it never fails. The mind convicts itself in advance when scoundrels are up to no good. How Antigone dealt with the situation was questioned by all who were involved, but poor behavior does not compare to the level of immorality shown in Creon's actions. Finally, when placed in the tomb intended for her to die in, Antigone hung herself, believing that her uncle had left her for dead, and she would die in the tomb anyways. Ironically, Antigone's choice to end her life was such a great disgrace in Greek culture that she would not have been allowed a burial, the very right for which she fought and was sentenced to death in the first place. While Antigone was left with a choice between a slow, painful death by starvation and suicide, the latter choice was viewed as one of the worst things she could have done. The Greeks, like most of us today, believe that life was given by the gods, and thus only the gods may make the decision to take it away. Though not directly related to her conflict with Creon, this choice does put her, at least in the view of ancient Greeks, in nearly as bad a moral position as Creon. Many Greek cities, including Thebes, did have patron gods. For Thebes, that was Dionysus. <laughs> But having a patron god and having a king rule by divine right are two uniquely different situations. A king such as Charlemagne or David, who is crowned or anointed by one believed to hold the authority of God himself rules, or is believed to rule by divine right, and is in place to represent the law of the god to the people. In a city with a patron god, they serve the god and give him offerings in return for the blessings and protection of whichever god agreed to be their patron. But all legal authority still resides with the king. Antigone is then stuck in a position where she must serve both a god and a man. For a Christian, this decision is made easy. No man can serve two masters, and God must always take priority. But Greek theology was, unsurprisingly, a little more complicated due to their multitude of gods. The Greek experimented with many different forms of government trying to find what was most functional, and with each form came a slightly different understanding of relationship between gods and government. Antigone clearly believed that her duty to the gods came first, refusing to follow the law against the burial of her brother because it wasn't Zeus who made this proclamation, nor did I think that your edict had such force that you, a mere mortal, could override the gods. Who it is that truly ought to have the power in that society is a bit of a subjective answer but both characters made their decisions based on their opposing paradigms and both suffered for them. The purpose of this paper was to determine who was in the right, but as has been seen, that is a much more complex question than it may seem on the surface. Of course, they were both foolish, sinful mortals to say the least, but strictly in the matter of burial against the king's will or of leaving the body to rot in the open, who was right? From the legal standpoint, Creon did have the power to prevent the burial of the body, and Antigone's refusal to comply with a direct command of the king is treason. However, from the moral side of things, Antigone did follow the law of the gods against her king, though she knew it would likely mean her death. Towards the very end of the play, the blind prophet Tiresias came to the king, and with the help of the chorus, convinces Creon that he is wrong that perhaps, if he wishes for his kingdom to continue, he must yield to the will of his people. And so he goes to personally free Antigone from the grave which he put her into. Unfortunately, by the time he's reached this decision to free Antigone, she has already hung herself, ending the play in sorrow for both Antigone, who is dead, and her uncle Creon, who is responsible for this death. One cannot, with a fully clear conscience, argue that either actor was fully in the right, but in the end, Creon did admit his folly. Though it was too late for, Antig for Antigone to admit hers, or to forgive Creon for the wrongs he had done. In the midst of a somewhat heated discussion between Creon and his son Haman, the boy uttered some of the most wisest words in the entire play. You've seen trees by a raging winter torn, how many sway with the flood and salvage every twig, but not the stubborn, they're ripped out, roots and all, bend or break. The same when a man is sailing, Pull your sheets too taut, never gonna give an inch, you'll capsize, and go the rest of the voyage, keel up, and rowing benches under. Creon held on to his pride and his despotic power too tightly, and his whole life snapped. 
Antigone, his wife Eurydice, and his son Haman all died because of him, and the whole city of Thebes turned against him for his poor decisions. I cannot argue that either Antigone or Creon were good, but remember the words of Haman, and the pride comes before the fall. Thank you very much, Mr. Ney. Um, uh, by the end of your play, you have argued that uh, both of these characters are fairly compromised in their actions, um, and that perhaps best we would remember that uh, pride goes before the fall. Now, um, if perhaps um, uh, both uh, Creon and Antigone had, had had more stories when they were young that taught you that pride comes before the fall, and they had that well ingrained in their conscience that even when things were difficult, they would remember that principle. How do you think that the storyline of this engagement between them would have differed? Could you resketch the story or perhaps draw the story out for us as to how the ending might have been different? Well, most of the story would have been avoided um, because <laughs> Creon made his initial statement that Polynices could not be buried, and then because of his pr pride, he would not change his mind. And Antigone was also very prideful, um, insisting that she was right in her belief of what the gods said, even though it was never clearly laid out that that is what the gods commanded. So I think Creon would have been more willing to allow some level of burial for Polynices, and Antigone may not have gone to such drastic measures. So all of the conflict, all of the deaths that happened after Polynices would have been avoided. So you're saying that and under that scenario, the the story would have finished with a a, a rightful burial for uh, Polynices and Antigone. Be, I don't know, uh, you know, a, a rightful burial, some sort of burial that was less than honorable to show that he was a terrorist, and Antigone would have been willing to go along with that, something like that. Yeah, I think that's something somebody suggested at the debate yesterday, and I think that is. That is a good compromise. Obviously, I don't know what these characters would have reached, what kind of compromise they could have reached. They're not real people, so nobody really knows that. Um, but I think if they'd both let go of their pride, this would have ended much better. Mm -hmm. They all would have lived happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And do you also see general principles from the play as to just the extent of um, the extent of the imposition upon freedom that a ruler can? Um, and good conscience uh, bring about. Um, I mean, when you look at Creon, you see in this story a sort of way of understanding um, when when governmental powers have gone too far in restricting freedom. I don't think this story fully um, has enough context, enough examples to really talk about how about freedom, um, since there's only the one example and it's very specific and there's a lot of background to it. Um, in this example, yes, I believe Creon went way too far in restricting freedom, but I don't think we can look too much into government theory just from this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you made the statement, I think in your second paragraph, these arguments are that government exists and has power solely by the consent of the people. And the second is that the only purpose of the government is to ensure the freedom of every citizen to the greatest extent possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, and yet, that seems to be kind of a singular, um, a singular political um, goal to have as the goal of government. Um, I was going to say, well, um, is the government's purpose not to ensure freedom, but to ensure the safety of its citizens. Um, I believe that freedom is, or that safety is a necessary part of freedom. Like, you could give everyone full freedom, you can do whatever you want, but it's the government's job to make sure that you don't use that freedom to take away other people's freedom. So yes, um, safety is a necessary part of that freedom. But I believe freedom is the priority. Safety is a means to that end. Uh, thank you very much. Other questions? <clears throat>
What do you mean by which one is right? Because you mentioned that there's a separation between church and state, and that was just the beginning of the paper, and you didn't mention it before or after that. But then at the end, you don't quite give an answer, but what was the question that you were asking? Um, my answer is that neither of them were right, right. because Creon, Creon violated standards beyond the law that should dictate how his law works. But if you're just looking at the law of Thebes and how that functions, Creon was right. He can do whatever he wants. Um, morally, though, and by broader political standards, Creon was wrong. Antigone, no matter what way you look at it legally, whether from Creon or from uh, Locke and Rousseau, the other political standards, Antigone was wrong legally. Um, morally, I think Antigone was justifiable. So these are whether or not their actions were justified, and that would be what made them right? Yes, but neither of them were right, so. Right, okay. Yeah. Just clarify. Heather. Um, first of all, good paper. I enjoyed listening to it. Thank you. Uh, especially after I did it yesterday. <laughs> and um, it's kind of going a little off point. But, uh, at the beginning of your paper, you said, um, which authority will be prioritized and at what point? Mm -hmm. One should disobey one authority for the sake of honoring the other, speaking of church and state. Yes. I was wondering, could you give an example where that would be appropriate? Like Where it would be appropriate to disobey one authority? One authority for the sake of the other. Um, as a Christian, when the state says to do something that goes against the law of God, I believe that we need to go against the state, like in communist countries where you can't worship. <clears throat> All the Christians are still getting together in secret and worshiping. Uh, so that's a simple example. Um, I don't believe the law of the state should ever be held above the law of God when it is the absolute law of God. When there's like sort of a sketchy area and we're not exactly sure what the Bible means, then follow the state. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, Holmes. I loved your paper in like every way, other than once or twice punctuation, but every other way. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way that you phrase things is just really great to hear, and um, your expression just shows a lot of reflection. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was simply confused at one point, mm -hmm. and then I had a more kind of analytical question. So the point yeah. which I was confused was surprisingly. I guess we were talking about Hegel. Um, Shocking. And um, rereading that Hegel quote reminded me just how little I understood of any of that book. Um, but in particular, you say that uh, about midway through your Hegel paragraph on page 12. I don't know if you have our same papers, but I don't. You say that um, Hegel believes that one's consciousness and sense of self comes entirely from interaction with others. Man does not form a self image from what he may think of himself or from his ability to think but from what he perceives others to think of him. Um, how do you think that comes to bear on the argument between Creon and Antigone? As I first read that, it seemed to be an argument for a relativistic self-definition, that we understand ourselves on the basis of others' perception of us. And right. in a case of two people arguing, they would both conclude they were guilty, because the other person saw them as guilty. So how would you relate that to... So how, how I was relating that to this is that a specific aspect of that relationship, the Lord's men, or the Lord and Bond servant relationship, is what we see with Antigone and Creon. Uh, Creon is the king, and so because of that relationship, how they gain their self-image from the other. Creon is who he is because he has the people and the people are who they are because that's what the king tells them. Um, so because of that, Creon has a responsibility to the people and how he treats them, how he talks to them, because he has that responsibility to give them a proper self-image. Uh, and similarly, Antigone owes him obedience. Uh, yes, I mean, okay. to an extent. Well, on the basis of that relationship. Yes. Okay, thank you. I see all right. Um, thank you for <laughs> um, helping explain that to me. So the it's very second confusing. thing is further up in the paragraph. Um, 
or maybe I guess with regard to some of what went prior, it seemed to me that you were making a kind of distinction between the legal and the moral yes. um, rectitude of each side. Hello. So, um, looking at it from a moral perspective, Creon has various duties. Looking at it from a legal perspective, Antigone is wrong. Um, one of the key parts of the debate yesterday was how far the moral and the legal conjoined. Can can you make an argument that Creon is absolutely morally wrong and therefore absolutely legally wrong as well? Um, can you speak to that at all? Is there a union of legal and moral? I think that depends on the government and what principles founded the government. Because I mean, it also depends on what your standard for morality is. Um, yes, I believe he was absolutely morally wrong. But, um, I think as the king, he, the way that their government worked, he could do what he wanted, whether it was considered moral or not. So I don't think the morality is what makes his actions legally wrong. Okay. Uh, Emily? Yeah. Um, which one would you say is more important, moral law or law of the government? Uh, talked about that a little bit with Anna, I think. Um, Moral law should take priority over legal law, legal law, uh, civil law, when they are contradictory because we have a higher duty to God than we do to the state. But when the moral law is unclear, then we do need to obey the civil law. Yes. Um, I have a question kind of based on your answering of Hans' question. Mm -hmm. You said that, uh, yes, he was wholly morally wrong, but that in regards to his kingdom because of the way Thebes law worked he was not uh, quite a tyrant however in your paper you talked about greater moral or greater sorry uh, philosophical perspectives in regards to government and how Creon was in fact wrong in that regards because of how he should use his law which then would you say trumps is it the actual law of Thebes in the story that he is under and therefore he is correct or the greater philosophical governmental principles which make him wrong which then would be greater, and so is he then correct or incorrect, or are they completely divorced and you cannot make that comparison? I don't think I know enough about how the government of Thebes worked to fully answer that, but I think that um, because... Give me just a second. Yeah, so his actions as king were tyrannical. That is what their government was, tyranny. Um, so his actions by the law of Thebes were fine. There's no way for the citizens to do anything about that. But if we're looking at it sort of philosophically, then it's easy to show that he is wrong because he is a tyrant. So he's wrong, but there's nothing they can do about it legally, if that does that answer the question? More or less. So what you're saying is that essentially it's yes and no. The two perspectives, that, that from just the story in Thebes itself and that from the greater philosophical perspective are conflicting, but that they can't quite be compared in a way that one can be called superior. Yeah, because there, because there is no way to enforce the philosophical principles on the civil body that exists. Given we're talking about this now, there's nothing we can do about that. No way to enforce it. Okay. Thank you. Simon. Uh, 
could you explain what you mean by saying that if Creon had more power, this wouldn't have happened? Um, basically that if Antigone, well, I'm not sure how to word it, but basically Creon, uh, I'm not sure, if, if he would have been able to just step in and have the power to stop everything she was doing, that would have been very good. Okay. Um, this could go either way. Either of those solutions would have prevented most of what happened here. But if we go with the tyrannical answer, Creon just locking her up immediately or preventing her from burying the body or contradicting him to start with, then it doesn't solve the problem. It stops this situation from happening while furthering the unrest of the people instead of resolving it. If we allowed Antigone to bury the body, if Creon had not held on to his pride and despotic power, then I believe that also would have solved the situation um, and shown that the king will work with his subjects as is what he is supposed to do as a king. Mr. Raskon. Since uh, the people of Thebes have given him the power of a tyrant, like all power, isn't it not the place of the people to then question what he does with that power? Tyrants are not given their power by the people. A monarch is given his power by the people and then claims the power of a tyrant. So yes, if the people had given him absolute power, they would have no right to question what he was doing. But they didn't give him absolute power. He uh, he was there by uh, hereditary, don't know the word for that. So he did have some amount of power as the monarch, but no, he was not given that power by the people. <laughs> but at any point, the people could stop listening to him and just kick him out. I mean, he's only there because they recognize him. So they are giving him that power. In, the in a way, yes, they... The problem with the tyranny is that the army will obey him and being able to organize the people, the amount of organization necessary to overthrow the tyrant is not something that happens easily, especially with the suppression that the tyrant can bring and preventing them from organizing that. So while that may be their desire to not live under the tyranny, as Antigone said that if they were not... Uh, if their lips weren't sealed in fear, they would be screaming against him. But as Antigone said, their lips were sealed in fear. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Thomas. Well, Mr. <laughs> I considered the other, uh, the elder Mr. Rascon. So, thank you. Um, uh, would you consider that an act of tyranny not allowing her to bury the body of her brother? Yeah. I would consider it an act of tyranny. Um, I think the context is necessary. I mean, not allowing a burial for certain reasons could be acceptable. Um, but given not only that Polynices was her brother, but Antigone or was his nephew, um, he needs to show respect to the rightful king who was Paul and Ices, even if the rightful king was not uh, behaving as a king should. Okay, can you define tyranny? Um, behaving the king basically ruling for yourself. Like as, as Creon said um, if I can find the quote he asked if he was ruling he asked where, why he rules if he was ruling for the people or for himself. And then just earlier, though, you referred to her acts of disobeying him and, and burying a man, um, you know, who was going you know, to bury him, um, the guy who was attacked in the city, who said that was treason. So it, treason is an act, is an act not just against, uh, is a disobedient act not just against the king, but against the state general. So wouldn't him not allowing her to honor him be just protecting the honor of the state and thus not um, solely, you know, ruling for him, as you say? Partially. When he initially said that Polynices couldn't be buried, 
that was with the intention of showing that traitors are not honored. However, we could allow a lesser burial for the traitor, still allowing basic rights to his family, to the citizens of Thebes and to Polynices. What this became about was about Creon's pride, not about him protecting the city. So you're just concerned with his motivation behind why he did it? Yes, because there was no... He, this wasn't protecting the city. It did no good for him to prevent Polynices from being buried. It ruined the city for him to not allow Polynices to be buried. So he was, it was about his pride that he didn't allow Polynices to be buried. Yes, Hans. So I have a question from someone over there. Um, they were asking about kind of the freedom of the people versus authority of the monarch. And you pointed out that kind of greater authority for Creon would not have solved the situation insofar as there would be uh, a level it would have it would have prevented some of the problems from occurring, but it would still have represented abuse in some sense. Yes. And then you said that more freedom for the people would have also prevented these situations from occurring and would also have been morally better. And my question was with regard to more freedom from the people, if he allows um, someone to defy one of his edicts, um, and then does not punish that and kind of go through with it. Does that not open up a sort of um, precedent of weakness in the government that could similarly be destructive? Yes. Um, if Antigone had gone straight from hearing his edict to going and burying the body against Creon's will, that would have been completely unacceptable and would have been showing weakness of the state if he didn't uh, respond to it as he did. But Antigone went to him and requested permission to bury Polynices. There was a whole argument, there was a whole play about it before she actually buried him. Um, yes, what Antigone did was wrong and should have been addressed by Creon to show that he wasn't weak. But it was because of his pride. It's not because he needed to show that the state was strong. He would not have the discussion with her because he was too prideful to consider allowing Polynices to be buried. And then once he was buried, it was because of his pride that he would not, or that he had to address Antigone, not because he wanted to show that the state was strong. Okay, good. Lily. Um, I'm sure there was, because he did, Paul Nices did come, he attacked the city that Creon was a part of, and while at the time Creon wasn't the king, um, he obviously really loves this power that he now has, very despotic and tyrannical. I can't say that it was his goal from the beginning to take over, but, I mean, you could make an argument that he encouraged the war, wouldn't let Ateocles give the throne to Polynices like he was supposed to, because he wanted power. Um, can't prove that because I don't know anything outside of the story, but it makes sense that this was all because he wanted power, didn't like Polynices being king. So I think yes. Anastasia? Um, so, I just had this question probably because you were the baby yesterday. Uh-huh. Um, you talked here, you give us sentencing a paper saying about Creon that he denied burial to his nephew Polynices, which gained him nothing but some personal satisfaction and the great displeasure of Antigone. Yes. Um, so my question was, I guess, whether or not you think that part of Creon's doing this was like <clears throat> to make an example of a traitor. You say earlier um, that Locke says that the right of a government to punish criminals does exist it is to the extent that they punish only to the extent necessary to create repentance and to deter the criminal and perhaps others from repeating a similar offense. Now, obviously, no one can repent in this situation because the guy's already dead. But right. I'm wondering if, despite what you're saying about Locke says, do you, do you think that in this particular situation, Creon was acting from personal pleasure and not from a desire to make an example of him? So... 
yeah, he, I believe he didn't allow burial for any of the people that fought against the city. Um, and it, he does want to make an example of Polynices. He said he wouldn't honor the traitor above the patriot. But as was also brought up in the debate yesterday, he could have honored the patriot above the traitor as he did give great honor to the patriot who was arguably not really a patriot um, and still allowed some burial well, burial for it. What's his name? Polynices. Uh, he could have still allowed a burial for Polynices and made an example of him. So I obviously don't know his true motives. Nobody does the story. But I believe that the extent to which he went is more of a personal vendetta, and oh, more for his own. Other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Nick. All right. Thank you all very much for your presentations this morning. Delightful to listen to you. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to have the uh, septathlon, so we need the lawn cleared. So if you guys could take all the chairs, just don't get up yet. Put all the chairs back around, the white chairs stacked over here, and the pop-ups collapsed and put over in that corner. And also, the potluck buyout people, the pizza's for you back there, but it's a lot more pizza than you guys tend to eat. So. If you guys would give the potluck buyout people maybe 15 minutes, let them get their pizza, and then the leftover stuff anybody can have, so they get eaten up. All right. On or off. Oh, I guess